It's Wednesday night, and we're live from Oaksdale, Washington, in the Educated Touch Studio. Welcome to FX Outside the Box, with your host, Nathan Nordstrom. Special guests include, to you. Here he is, Nathan Nordstrom. All right, welcome to FX Outside of the Box. Um, if you haven't um, watched any of my uh, webinars uh, this year, welcome to your first one. Um, we are going through the National Certification Board's um, massage, th massage Therapy and Body Works uh, Code of Ethics and Standard of Practice. Um, we are excited to have you with us. Um, I have been doing this now for eight months, um, and or, yeah, we're on the ninth month now, so we're a little over eight months. Excited to have you because we're transitioning in the uh, standards of practice to the next standard. And so I want to kind of introduce those. Um, first, I'm going to start off the way I always do um, with the hello, but I want to then go to the place where we find the National Certification Board uh, Code of Ethics and Standard of Practice. This is actually Facebook. So hello, Facebook. If uh, you are on it's great to see you. We've got a couple of people who are watching, um, but I'm going to go to um, the ncbtmb.org. This is the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Workers website. Um, we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom because, yes, knowing how to get to the National Certification Board's website is Definitely one thing. However, the next important thing is that you can find out what you're committing to when you look at about. You have the about the NCB. You have the bylaws. You have the certification board themselves. We have the code of ethics. We have the NCB policies. We have standards of practice and webmail. So we are going to the standards of practice. I don't think the webmail is for just anybody. I think that's probably for specific people who are trying to get into, uh, who are on the NCB staff. So as we scroll on down, we see the preamble for the standard of practice. We already went through the code of ethic, as I said. Standard of practice one was a doozy. It lasted a while. Standard of practice two it was pretty long. Standard of practice three kind of kept us going only for about two and a half weeks. Um, we actually started um, the standard 3E last week, and this week we're actually going through standard e, 3E and then starting on standard 4, which is business practices. So this is a kind of exciting one for me to, to talk to you about. But I wanted to kind of go back and have you look at those specific pieces. So standard 3 um, itself as a category is confidentiality. And so it is all about the importance of making sure that um, any documentation that you have is appropriate documentation that is uh, dealt with legally in a way that um, makes sure that you're managing documentation as well as how you dispose of documentation. So standard 3E is dispose of client's file in a secure manner. Um, standard 3E is, I mean, that, that seems pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's not uh, rocket science to say you need to make sure that um, you don't just put them out on the front porch and let anyone see them, especially if they've got social security numbers or any um, important document uh, numbers or information. However, it's, uh, it's really important to kind of think about, okay, so how much information is getting out according from you about that client. Um, there's information that a massage therapist is privy to that uh, general public may not need to know or should not know. So uh, aches and pains, problems, um, also age, so date of birth, um, people want to hold on to that information. So when it, you look at disposal of documentation, if you are in the medical side of massage therapy, uh, HIPAA actually has a standard of seven years. If you're not on the medical side and you're more on the spa side, the National Certification Board says keep documentation for 
four years. Uh, but once you have completed that, once you've gotten through the four years after the end of the uh, therapeutic session, then you go back and you say, okay, so what am I supposed to do with those files? They need to be shredded. Okay. Now there's security shredding and there's security shredding and there's super ultimate security shredding and there's um, companies that you can hire to come and make sure that everything is mixed and shredded and you're never going to get the information back. Key things that I tell people is shredding it is going to give it a, give people a harder time of recreating their data. You don't have a lot of people coming after massage therapist data um, for their clients. So to piece together a puzzle of a shredded uh, soap note um, would be a challenge. Um, and I suggest you do it. If you've got a large file list of files, then um, do it regularly so it's not piling up. If you're a single, client, uh, single therapist in your own office, then you know what, annually, set up a day and say, okay, I'm going to go through my files and make sure that I don't have anything, anyone that's over the amount of time that I need to for seven years, four to seven years, depending on, on what, how you work. Um, so that's important thing to, to go about. Now, also, um, as I said, there's a difference for uh, clinical massage therapists versus, versus um, spa therapists or relaxation-based therapists. Um, because the National Certification Board has four years. Easy statement, if you see anyone clinically, hold everyone to that standard. Ha hold all of your soap notes to that standard because that's the higher of the two. And then maintaining that standard allows you to uh, keep everyone safe and not accidentally throw someone away early who should have been, you should have held on to it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. Um, I didn't quite go into where I'm at and why I'm, uh, what hotel I'm in. I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm uh, in Olympia, Washington. I'm going to the AMTA Washington State Chapters um, Fall Education Conference. And so I'll be teaching Friday and Sunday mornings uh, for, for the conference. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's going to be great to, to see people from the Washington chapter uh, of AMTA. But I, I got to put a positive spin out there that um, conferences are a great opportunity to do more than just get classes. Um, you get a lot of community building. You get a lot of insight. You get a lot of uh, understanding about what's going on in your local area. A lot of times if they have a lobbyist that's uh, going, they'll usually have the lobbyist speak. Um, and the business aspects of what's going on in the industry really come out and really te uh, teach you a lot about what, um, what's going on and why. So it's, uh, it, it's always fun to go to, to conferences, um, especially your local conference. If you have a local um, whatever state you're in, you've got a local chapter. Um, and so go and, and ask and connect. Um, it's a great, great opportunity. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys in, uh, in Ocean Shores, Washington, uh, Friday morning or Sunday morning. Uh, feel free to come up and say hello. Uh, if you, uh, if you are there, if not, then well, hello. <laughs> we'll, hopefully we'll see you, uh, see you sometime anyway. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm at and what I'm doing. Um, if I'm, I'm just checking back on Facebook to see if we have, uh, anybody who's really joined us on the Facebook, uh, live feed. Maybe, maybe my Facebook page is kind of acting a little weird. And, 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 well, maybe I'm not on Facebook Live. That is an oddity. Um, if I am on Facebook Live, hello. If I'm not, then I guess I'm not. Um, just a few moments until I... Oh, I 
guess I am on Facebook Live. Oh, good. Okay. So I think I got one person who's joined me. Hope all is well. All right. Hello, Joyce. It's uh, good to have you with me. Um, all right. So, Joyce, I've got uh, got you up here on the messenger. So, if you want to chime in at any time, feel free to uh, to do so. So, I I just taught an ethics class in Kentucky, um, and it was really kind of fun for me because one of the things that I do when I'm teaching ethics classes is I talk about what is the difference between laws, morals, and ethics. So laws are obviously the things that our community sets up or our population sets up to make sure that things are, are copesthetic between the community, the community members, things that are basic uh, principles that need to be done by everyone in a community. Easy, done. Morals are actually set up by the religious structure to give you a basic understanding of why the, a greater power or uh, a belief or an action needs to happen. However, ethics is why you do what you do. So ethics goes into your behavior and why you do it. And that behavior can be because of morals. That behavior can be because of laws. Those are all possibilities but it's not the only thing. It's not the only reason. So um, guilt you, it usually plays a role in your ethical responses. Um, gut responses, excitement can play a role. Um, those are all pieces to be thinking about when you're kind of pulling in, why do we do what we do? So if we go to the NCB code of ethics or standard of practice, the code of ethics itself is one piece. The code of ethics is a unified code where not quite law, but we're all committing to follow a certain code of standard. Um, the other side is the standards of practice. So on a standard of practice, we actually start seeing several pieces here. I'm going to open up uh, the standard of practice again so people can read it hopefully someplace here there we go share and standard of practice so the standard on pra of practice number three on confidentiality is based off of uh, protect the confidentiality of the client's identity and inform and information in all conversations advertisements and any and all other matters unless disclosure uh, of identifiable information is required by the client in writing is medically necessary or is required by law. So that's confidentiality. It says you can't use their information unless it's medically necessary, the client has put it in writing, or it's required by law. Pretty straightforward. It, it becomes a black and white issue with that. Um, I also like really am kind of fond of um, conversations, advertisement, and in any other materials unless disclosed. So conversations is the one that I think a lot of massage therapists have a problem or a challenge with. Um, when you're walking a client out of the treatment room and into the uh, waiting room and there's other people there, being conscious of what you say, being conscious that you're being conf uh, you have confidentiality that you're not going to be talking about things about their treatment protocol and their treatment session outside of the room. Um, now, is that confidentiality breached when you're talking to the receptionist and saying, "Hey, we want to see her, uh, her or him back uh, at this time?" Nope, that's creating a treatment plan and ex executing the treatment plan. Um, but saying, "Oh gosh, I." Hope that back pain gets better and I, I'm sorry to hear about this and that and all these other challenges. That's the challenge. Now when you start looking at documentation from that confidentiality of information, you're looking about documentation of health history, the soap notes that you're keeping or clinical chart notes or, or chart note noting, any of those types of pieces. Those are important to connect with. 
um, and remember that those need to be safe and secure. Protect the identity of the clients who are minors um, and according to HIPAA um, and the state of Oregon and several others, um, the key piece is that you have to keep their documentation until they are no longer a minor plus seven years. So you got to be conscious of that. Um, solicit only information that is relevant and professional to the client therapeutic relationship. This is important to only ask questions that are related to the session. You don't need to know about um, the date they had last night or how their family's doing or other things unless it is related specifically to the session. You can always justify things. I totally understand justifying things by your own choice, but that is one of those pieces to be conscious of. Um, securely retain clients' files for a minimum period of four years. So all files need to be retained for at least four years um, for NCB and seven years for clinical, as I already talked about, and then dispose of clients' files in a secure manner. So how do you get rid of them securely? Now, that was the quick intro. So let's go into standard for business practices. A certificate shall practice with honor, integrity, and lawfulness in the business of therapeutic massage and body work. In his or her professional role as a certificate shall, standard for A, provide a physical setting that is safe and meets all applicable legal requirements for health and safety. Okay, um, provide a physical setting. So what if you are an outcall therapist? Hmm? I mean, is that the same? Does that negate that statement? Are you no longer applying a physical setting? Well, you may not be applying a physical setting, but that's not the key piece that has to be there. You actually are providing the facility, the facility in a traveling setting. So you've got the table and you got to make sure that that's available and upright and, and doing everything it should. Um, I know and I'm grateful that I haven't had this experience, but I know people who have had tables that have collapsed because they weren't maintained or um, the screws on a portable table, the legs, um, they didn't check those every couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, the older your table gets, the more you have to make sure everything's good. Um, I, I went to visit my parents and, uh, they have a massage table. Um, so whenever I come over, I can, can use it, uh, use it as, uh, as I went over there, I was getting ready to get my, my mom on the table to help her out. And, uh, I looked down and I'm like, Oh, hold on. You can't get on the table because the whole screw had come completely off and the leg would have just fallen off. That's not a good thing to just have a leg fall off. So I uh, made sure to screw them all down and then put a note in my head to say, I really need to make sure that I'm, I'm maintaining it. And whenever, before I get someone on a table, I am taking care of the table and making sure that that's all ready. So, those are all there. Hello, Emily. Hello, Celeste and Patty and uh, Joyce. If you guys are all hanging about, it's great to great to see you. Um, all right. So the other thing that I, I wanted to connect, especially with this one, is the physical uh, setting that is safe and meets all applicable legal requirements. Um, this is one of those pieces that, you know, if you're not meeting all the legal requirements, um, this could also be a part of the, the challenge where you have the American Disability Act, the ADA compliance. Um, this could be a fact where you have to have a setting set up available for clients. I know, um, I've worked in I've worked in a lot of different settings, um, and so when I think of the best settings, um, they've been settings where the you have a electric lift table or hydraulic table where the table goes down low enough, 
Um, you've got uh, nice wide doors um, so that wheelchairs can get through. Uh, you've got ramps in the front if you have stairs, if you need stairs in the facility. All those things are pretty important. Sorry. So as you look at what your facility looks like and, and what you're going to be building for your practice, how are you going to make sure that you have legal and safe settings for them? That's an important piece. It's important to watch out and be conscious of what you're, what you're needing to do for your, all your clientele. Now, what happens if you don't have a setting that is ADA compliant? Um, it may be that the building you're working in is 60 years old and was predated before the ADA and you have someone who um, wants to schedule an appointment but they are wheelchair bound. Um, how do you go about that and how, how can you help them? How can you make sure that things are right? Um, you get creative. I know it seems simple, it seems weird, but you get creative. The more creative you get, the better off you get. Um, I also think of that for your treatment plan, but we're not going to get into that today. But if you have a client who has something specific, can you deal with it? Um, I years ago had a client who uh, was wheelchair bound and we didn't have a ramp. Um, so he brought his own ramp. Then we also realized that, you know, it's getting the ramp out and getting it down and getting him up um, was a lot of work. And so we figured out a way to get him up the two stairs with him leaning backwards and, and getting right up, uh, pulling him up the stairs uh, fairly easily. He wasn't a, a large, large guy and I had a, a good ability to, to get him on and off the table. Um, that was very helpful. It was very beneficial for me to be able to talk with that, um, that client be willing to create, be creative. I mean, those are all safety guidelines in how you work with the right person and make sure that they're, um, make sure that they're happy with the services and the products that you're able to give. But it also meets that standard, um, that you are creating a safe and healthy environment. All right. So we can talk about the physical health. What are some of the things that we can think about for mental health? Um, as a massage therapist, you're not trained as a health specialist for psychology. A, if you've ever had a massage therapist um, ask you about your personal life and start probing into kind of things or giving you advice, um, that's a challenge. That's a piece where feasibly um, you might not have, you might have people who are not skilled in helping you overcome dysfunction, helping you overcome the challenges in life that you have. A professional counselor is, uh, is a person that um, a massage client can go to. And I always suggest that a massage therapist have um, documentation for a uh, have business cards for a professional counselor that is always good in really kind of the pieces that um, you're connecting with and in the pieces that you're communicating with so that your clients don't ever have any questions on uh, what you can talk about and what you can't talk about now Do psychological effects affect the, the physiological body? Um, when you see someone who is depressed, is there a physio physiological change in how they look and how they feel? There definitely is. Um, the physiological aspect of how people feel and the, physio or the physiological aspect of how people uh, look when they're feeling a certain way. Um, I think the opposite direction of this is if you have someone who's just run them, um, run their best time, their posture, their stance, 
yes, they're tired, but they've got a posture that denotes success. Where if you have someone who's depressed, they have a posture that is torn down, broken down, um, and tired. So if you have a client who is going through a challenging time, then being able to connect with them and offer them an opportunity to kind of get something off their mind and talk about the physical body, connect it right back to the purpose, connecting it back to what you're focusing on and why you're focusing on it. Just like if you had a client who was um, getting married that week, she was coming in for a massage to get ready for her wedding. Um, I would expect that the therapist would say, well, congratulations. Um, and would ask about j just kind of the small talk of, is everything ready? How are you doing? To understand the level of stress that she's in. Because if she's saying, gosh, I just need to relax. And you're like, okay, so are you, how are things going? Where are you at? Oh, I haven't done anything. I'm so far behind. I'm so, I, I, I'm just, I'm lost. Okay. Then no matter how much you relax or go through the muscle muscles and try and relax her posture, as soon as she gets up and gets off the table, she's going to be right back into that, um, that stressful environment. Excuse me. Right back into that stressful environment to try and um, connect and communicate and try and get everything going there. Um, so there are some things that you should know. Sorry for the yawn, guys. Um, and so when you, hey, Cedric, how's it going, buddy? Um, when you're looking at what you want to do, what you are doing, and um, why you're doing it, it's important that you're looking at the psychological health of your clients as much as the physiological health of your clients. So keep the table safe. Keep the facility safe. Um, I've seen some, I've seen a lot. I mean, you guys know I've been around the profession for a long time. Um, you know that I've been out and connected with, uh, with the profession to see what people are doing and why. Um, I've seen massage offices in shacks. Um, I've seen massage offices in places that really no one should have a business because the ceilings uh, breaking in or the floorboards aren't secure. Um, those are things that can be problematic and you need to take care of if it's not a safe environment. Um, I've seen, I saw a massage room and it had a floor to ceiling window that looked out and I just kind of went, how do you, how do you, to put a draping over that floor to ceiling window so that your client can get on the table or do you, and you just kind of go, oh, okay, nope, we're good. Um, those are, those are challenges. That's stuff that I, I don't know how you overcome. Um, I can create ideas. Um, I guess ideas that I would go to, but if you have, um, a facility that, you like but isn't exactly the most professional start thinking about what could make it more professional what could make you um, really draw into that next piece of safety and security um, it's always important to to have a safe environment for the uh, for your clients okay so once again going back here provide a physical setting that is safe and meets all applicable legal requirements for health and safety. All right. So legal requirements. Several months ago, I had a massage therapist from Georgia reach out to me, someone who I taught a couple of classes for. And for questions, were pretty direct. Uh, she had gotten a job at a uh, an office 
and she was going to be paid as an independent contractor. And her question was, do I need to have a business license? Um, and I said, well, in some counties, in some cities, you do. However, you don't always have to. It depends on the city or the county. So if you are working in a city or a county that doesn't require it, then you'll be fine. If you live in a city or a county that does requirement, you're going to have to go find out. And she had no clue where to go. So I did a little digging and searching. And I, I, I don't know if I just kind of have a knack for these types of things or an ability to kind of say, well, let's try it. What, what would we lose if I just kind of looked around? So the first place that I went is to the, um, to the town or city's website and typed in the name of the town or the name of the city and business license. And so that gave me an opportunity to look at uh, the laws that their town or city has so that I can make an assessment to see if you are supposed to have a business license or if it's just a facilities license. So if you own a facility, um, in this type of case where you're working out of another office, you wouldn't own a facility. You'd be an independent contractor at someone else's facility. So um, that's kind of the first step to do, is kind of look at your town or city. Once you have that done, you have to go to the county and see if the county law requires uh, you to have a business license. These are important things to look up. Just because you have a massage license doesn't mean you can work anywhere you darn well please. You actually have to follow the laws that are in your city, county, and, and your local, uh, any of your local ordinances. Okay. Um, I just heard about a Kentucky law that um, requires that if you sell anything or you're a spa, you have uh, private, um, they, they want to tax you. And so the uh, state is sending out these threatening letters that say you have to register um, with us to make shit so that we can, um, we can make sure that we're getting ta the right taxes from you. Well, I've got several friends in Kentucky who are massage therapists who run a clinical setting and don't sell anything. And so they don't need to be paying that tax um, or registering to pay tax uh, as, a, as a service um, in, in that aspect. And they wouldn't have known if they didn't call and, and inform them of what their business setting looks like. So if you're thinking about hey, I want to make sure that I'm following the laws, I'm, I have a legal business, you have to look at not only what type of business you are, um, if you have a facility, if you need to register with the city, the state, or the county, um, but you have to look at what other business aspects you have. If you're selling any products, um, you have to be looking at that uh, income tax specific to product sales in most states. So it's important for you to go in and say, okay, well, I'm going to be selling this, I'm going to be selling that, so that you know how much in taxes you have to pay. Because if you're not paying your taxes on that, um, a, they can come after you. Uh, that whole wonders of the federal, uh, the federal and state government. Um, but you also then have this other group, uh, or this other type of income that is tax deductible. So you have income and expense from buying the product and selling the product, and then you only are taxed on the uh, income you make on those products. So important to kind of connect with and to be conscious of when you're out there and, uh, and looking at your business. Um, 
first of all, I'm also wondering why Cedric is still awake since he's on the East Coast. Um, so hopefully, Cedric, you went to bed. Um, all right, so we've got that. Let me go to one more aspect of this specific law, which I'm, I really do like and want you guys to to be thinking about specifically. So provide a physical setting that is safe and meets all applicable legal requirements for health and safety. Health. There are things that massage therapists do that are considered not healthy uh, for their clients, which is dangerous, which is concerning. So what are some things that are not healthy for a massage therapist to do for their clients or on their clients? Um, in some cases, deep tissue is not considered a healthy technique. So to me, that kind of relies on this comment of if you're, if you have clients, you need to do a health history. What, are, what information are you supposed to get from the health history? You're supposed to create a treatment plan that you can then act upon in that treatment plan because that treatment plan is then going to give you an idea of what you should or should not be doing while working with that client. I've had plenty of clients that I have had to change my treatment plan because of what I found out during the session. You can do a great intake interview and really get a lot of information. And then next thing you know, they forgot about that one thing that just happened this last week. Or if you're not trained in a subject like oncology, it's going to be important for you to look at oncology or look at pregnancy or look at any of these conditions that you can have a problem with or you can injure the client or the baby or anything else if you're not doing it right. Okay. You got to be conscious of those wonderful possible uh, skills. There are two classes that I think every massage therapist should take directly out of massage therapy school. There's two. The first one that I suggest is pregnancy massage. And I think pregnancy massage should be taught at no less than 12 hours of education. You know what, let's do something here. Let us go to the internet. Um, the, I'm going to show you what I do when I am looking for a continued education class. And it may not be great, may not be perfect, but it is Nathan Nordstrom's foolproof plan for... Uh, okay. Nathan Nordstrom's foolproof plan for finding good continued education. Okay, so first thing I do is I find an open page and go to ncbtmb.org. And when that comes up, I scroll halfway down the page on the left hand side. It has the find a board certified massage therapist and then find an approved CE provider. Find an approved continuing education provider is one of those pages that you kind of go, okay, NCB has vetted uh, them and they've gone through an application process. And so in that process, you're going to filter down a little bit of information. So I don't usually care who the provider's name is unless I'm looking for someone very specific. I don't care where they're from, city or state, uh, country. I might 
be willing to say, okay, I want someone from the United States, but they don't have to be. You have CE hours, and then you have all categories. So if you look down this uh, chart in here of active isolated stretching, uh, acupressure, advanced science, uh, let's see, we're going for assessment, let's see, body work, body physiology, going down to pregnancy, right? H H A K L M N O. Pregnancy massage. So I left everything else blank and just searched pregnancy massage. Let's see how many um, how many responses there are on the NCB um, CE provider locator for pregnancy massage. Fourteen pages of what? Probably twenty five. Yes, 14 pages of 25. So these are pregnancy massage classes. And so the course title is on the left, the CE hours, uh, the category we've, we filtered by pregnancy massage, and then the name of the provider, and then the business or organization that is it. And then if you want to see more details on that instructor or other classes that they do, you can hit details. Um, I'm going to go back one more time and kind of do a little more filtering here because you see that there's one hour classes, two hour classes, let me do 16 hour classes in pregnancy massage. We'll see how many 16 hour classes there are. Well, two pages. Okay. That's not bad. I'm going to go see how many on the second page here. But pregnancy massage is one of those classes that I suggest that every new massage therapist um, get, male, female. Uh, if you plan on working on or focusing on um, pregnant people, I would say even probably more than 16 hours, but definitely at least 16. Uh, two, four, six, eight, 12. Okay, 25, so 37, 16 hour classes. Um, so the second one, which I find is uh, as important, if not more important, um, instead of pregnancy massage, it is oncology. Uh, oncology massage is cancer. And it's important that you get trained in oncology because you never know when your clients are going to be diagnosed. And if you have more than two handfuls of clients, if you have more than 10 clients, um, you're likely to get someone who has cancer or has had cancer. Making sure that you're safe there is a really important process. So if you look down these classes for oncology, I have a couple of challenges here making because I don't, I don't believe, I'm going to give out my own bias. If you're one of these instructors who has, uh, has what I'm talking about, then please contact me and talk to me about it. I don't think a two hour class is going to prepare you, um, for working on oncology patients. Um, and there's so many different ways that you can look at this oncology patients who are in the hospital. Definitely not. Oncology patients who are going through uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, definitely not. Um, so oncology patients who are survivors of cancer, that's going to be a different group. Um, and then oncology patients who, uh, even people who are getting ready to have cancer, uh, you don't know when they have it, when they don't have it. Uh, the easy answer that I've heard many times is we've all got cancer. Um, it's just that our body keeps it in check. Um, for oncology, I actually suggest that everyone get 24 hours. Um, and that number is actually created from the Society for Oncology Massage. 
as a basic um, or a, a introductory class or a basic um, basic class that gets you through the basic knowledge. Um, I love that uh, oncology instructors who are willing to work with a hospital or work with other facilities so that they can connect with um, in the class you can work on actual people who have cancer um, that's that's a huge benefit not only to their patients um, and those patients who come in but also a huge benefit to the to the hospital um, because then they get an opportunity to have a positive experience there with, uh, with them. So I'm looking at uh, 24 hour classes on oncology and there's only one page of 24 hour classes in oncology. So there's probably a lot of 20 hour classes, 22 hour classes, uh, 32 hour classes, all of those kind of are in the same game. They really have worked to create a structure so that you're going to be safe. You're going to be under, you're going to be working with their understanding. Um, but you're helping to create safety for those clients. You're trying to create an experience where those clients are actually having, um, not going to have to second guess your ability to keep them healthy and safe. So the facility is important to really kind of look at keeping them safe, but also your continuing education skills need to be up to snuff to make sure to keep them safe as well. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Um, we've been out at about 15 minutes, uh, five zero. Um, I do want to actually draw some attention for you guys, uh, to you guys. Um, once again, if you are going to be at the Washington State Chapter uh, Convention from AMTA, um, please come say hello. Uh, we're going to be having some fun. We're going to talk ethics um, on Friday. We're going to talk about um, fully exposed ethical dilemmas. We're going to get into stories. We're going to get into experiences. Um, sounds like it's going to be a pretty good-sized class that really kind of engages um the, the topics of ethics and engages people's abilities and excitement. So that's going to be on Friday. And then on Sunday, we're going to talk about um, uh, leadership and uh, leadership in the healthcare facility and leadership in the health community. Um, massage, therapy, massage therapy, being a leader in healthcare is kind of the title of the class. And that class really kind of goes through um, leadership skills um, how to connect with other medical professionals, uh, what they're looking for, what you're looking for, and how to kind of create a symbiotic relationship with other medical professionals. If you've never worked with a chiropractor, if you've never worked with an osteopath, if you've never worked with um, a surgeon, um, really how to step in and step out and make sure that they know that you're excited about it, you've got a skill set that they're looking for, and informing them so that you can be an advocate for your clients as well as an advocate for healthcare um, because the terming terminology now for healthcare has changed so much and has really kind of progressed into a whole brand new system of understanding that we are in that lead position in so many different ways. We are in that, um, that really developmental stage of what, healthcare is instead of as soon as they pulled apart healthcare and, and sickness care um, that really gave us two separate pieces um, to kind of fit into the medical system and the healthcare world um, so that's that's kind of where where we're at there i'm also having an opportunity to go up to the san juan islands and uh, hang out with my friend adam and chelsea uh, who are getting married this weekend. So uh, excited to, uh, to see everybody and to do everything. Hopefully you have a great week. If you have any questions, you can reach me at Nathan at educatedtouch.com. Uh, you can also reach me um, via my phone, 503-706-2480. Um, 
you can reach out to me on, on Facebook Messenger, any of those things. Um, if you have friends who haven't uh, watched these, you can go to YouTube and go in on, uh, you know what, let me take you to YouTube. Why the heck not? I've got a few moments here. Um, and going back to here. And on, you, on YouTube. Um, YouTube.com. And actually, you could have a direct link on my Facebook page. So connect to either Educated Touches Facebook page or Ethics Outside of the Box Facebook page. And you'll actually be able to see um, all of our YouTube videos down on the uh, YouTube link uh, that's on the bottom of the page. Okay, YouTube's not wanting to play there. So let's uh, go here and I'm gonna hit, hello, Sonia Dingman, it's good to see you. Ethics outside the box, enter. And we are the only ethics outside the box on Facebook. And we're pulling up that ethics class and the whole series. So as I said, I've been doing this uh, once a week now for eight plus months. And so that really does kind of start building up quite a list of videos. Um, at the bottom you have YouTube right there. And that's gonna link you right to Ethics Outside the Box YouTube page and pull up all of the videos that YouTube has um, for ethics outside of the box. Eventually, as soon as that thinking, um, the wheel of death is what I've heard it called so many times. Last week was Mr. David Otto and myself. Uh, that was number 36. So we've this will be episode 37 but you've got all the previous episodes down here um, on the YouTube page on Ethics Outside of the Box. Or if you go to YouTube, all you have to do is search Ethics Outside the Box there, and they should be able to give you, um, give you all the classes you need. Remember, you can actually take continuing education for these. Once you're done, you would go to educatedtouch.com. Um, and I'm gonna share, show you that page too. Um, educatedtouch.com and if you go down and you have a specific class that you are interested in, test for online web-based videos, um, you can click on that and it will pull up uh, any class from any date. Um, you have it by date or by episode number. The hours flown by. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion with Ethics Outside the Box. As you've seen, Nathan uses many second-hand stories of ethical situations. If you'd like to share your story or you have any questions, feel free to contact him and Nathan at EducatedTouch.com. If you have just watched this video and would like to continue in education for home study, you can go to shop.educatedtouch.com under the home study options with the date or episode number to receive your exam. If you would please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, we will keep you up to date on new videos. If you'd like to attend one of our live courses, you can find upcoming scheduled events at www.educatedtouch.com. Thank you for joining us today.